60 chances, many second chances, third chances, fourth chances, that you are a long-suffering and patient God. We ask that you would help us to take advantage of that and not to harden our hearts as those of ancient times did. We pray in the name of Christ our King. Amen. We are in the second cycle of plagues. We remind ourselves that the plagues come in three cycles of three each. And the first three plagues are ministered by Aaron, Moses, or God. Who remembers? The first three plagues. Aaron. The second three are brought by Moses. And the third three by the staff of God himself. The first three plagues, do the Israelites come under the plagues or not? Yes, but then the last six, they don't. Each of the cycles of plagues runs through a certain sequence. Does anybody remember what that sequence is? The first, second, and third in each cycle strikes against certain things. Okay, water, land, and air. The first plague in each cycle strikes the water, the second strikes the land, and the third strikes the air. Another aspect of that is that we have kind of a rising motion. In the first three plagues, we start with the water, then Aaron stretches his rod out over the water, and the water brings up frogs, and the land becomes foul. Then we strike the dust, and it goes into the air and becomes gnats. We're sort of moving up. The last three plagues, we're way up in the sky. Hail comes from the heaven. That's a water plague. Locust comes all over the land from the air. That's a land plague. The sun goes out. That's the highest of the plagues against the sky. So we're moving up in a very visual sense. The plagues become more and more intense. The beginning of each cycle is marked by the fact that Moses is told to go to Pharaoh in the morning, early in the morning. The second plague in each cycle is marked by the fact that they're just told to go to Pharaoh. And the third plague in each cycle has no warning at all. And here we are in chapter 9, verse 1, and we are at the fifth plague, which is the second of the second cycle. The first plague we looked at last week in the second cycle were swarms of insects. A variety of insects, possibly, the kind that would defoliate, eat up a lot of the vegetables, and generally wreck the economy of Egypt at that point, a more severe judgment. And now we come to the second in this cycle, second cycle, and that's the fifth plague, the pestilence on livestock, and that's in chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. Let me read it. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and speak to him. Thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. It's always his name Yahweh through here. Jehovah, Lord in all capitals. Because it's the revelation of that name that's important in Exodus. And because Pharaoh has said, Who is this Jehovah that I should hearken to him? So at every point, the name Jehovah is the one, or Yahweh is the one that's preeminent. Thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. Let my people go that they may be my slaves. The word serve and slave is the same in the Bible. The question is, whose slaves are they? And if you refuse to let them go and continue to hold on to them, behold, the hand of the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence on your livestock that are in the field. And then there are five kinds of livestock. Number five is half a ten. It's one of those significant numbers in the Bible. Number five occurs throughout the description of the tabernacle. It's a number of strength. We'll see later on when Israel comes out of Egypt, it says they came out in martial array. Clearly, is they came out five in a rank. And so the number five is half of ten. You have elders over tens. And then within that, they are organized five in a rank. That number is another significant number, and it has to do with strength. Doubling five, ten has to do with great strength. Number five has to do with strength. And the pestilence on the five kinds of livestock listed here, the fact that five are listed, Others might have been, it might have been a different number, but it points again, because the numbers are so significant in Exodus, it points to the fact that their staff of life is broken, their hand is cut short. So verse 3 again of chapter 9, Behold, the hand of the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence on your livestock that are in the field. And then there are five mentions, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds of cattle, and the flocks. Interesting mention of camels here. Camels are not mentioned all that often in the Bible, but uh, here they are. Usually in the law we'll read about the ox and the ass, or about the ox and the sheep. Not so much mention of horses, except they were told they were not to have a lot of horses. When you get to the kingdom period, you read more about horses. 
So very seldom do we read about camels. But here the camels were struck. And that's important. So each of these animals had its place. The horse is a weapon of war. The donkey is a carrier of burdens. The camel has international trade. And the Egyptians engaged in a lot of international trade. They were the breadbasket of the ancient world. Their camels are struck. The caravans are not going to work. The herds of cattle, sacred, also a source of food, and the flocks of sheep, which the Egyptians viewed as an abomination, but yet they still made use of the products of sheep. The Lord, it says, verse 4, will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing will die of all that belongs to the sons of Israel. So now we have this distinction reiterated. We saw in the last plague that God said, from now on I put a distinction between the Israelites and the Egyptians. Plagues will not come on the Israelites. Now if you were an Egyptian, and you had just gone through the plague of insects, and now it's announced again publicly to Pharaoh and everybody that the livestock of the Hebrews will be spared, but the livestock of the Egyptians will be plagued. What might this motivate you to consider doing? Well, you might protest a little bit, but if you had a good response to this, what would it be? Yeah, kind of try to get under that umbrella of the Hebrews. See, there's always evangelism involved here. The warnings are always opportunities to the wicked to repent. And if you're in this situation and you're thinking properly, you tend to want to become identified with the sons of Israel, which we will see many of the Egyptians do. Verse 4, the Lord set a definite time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So they have 24 hours in which to make a decision. They can leave their livestock out in the field or take them in. Will they identify with the Israelites or not? There's a pun here in Hebrew that you don't see. Verse 3 says the Lord will send a very severe pestilence, and that Hebrew word is dever. Verse 5 says the Lord will do this thing in the land. The word thing is davar. So in Hebrew there's a pun. It's as if tomorrow the Lord will do this pestilence in the land is the implication. We don't see that, of course, because our words don't match up the way theirs do. So the Lord did this thing on the morrow, and all the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the sons of Israel, not one died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not even one of the livestock of Israel dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Now, it says here in verse 6 that all the livestock of Egypt died. But just a few verses later, we'll find another plague on livestock. So how do we understand it? And there's two possibilities. One is that the word all, all the livestock, is not taken in an absolute sense, but in a general sense. And that's true very often in the Bible. The word all is used in a colloquial way. If we said that when the men came home from desert storm, everybody went out to hear them. Everybody went out to meet the plains. Would that mean that every single person in this entire community went out to meet the plains? No. We would understand that that meant a whole bunch of people went out to meet the plains. And so it's possible that that's all that's meant here. The Hebrew doesn't imply anymore. Well, then it's also possible that this means all the livestock of Egypt that were in the field died. That's where the plague is, verse 3. I will send a very severe pestilence on the livestock that are in the field. And he gave them 24 hours. And so perhaps a lot of the Egyptians took them out of the field and put them into sheltered areas or other places where they were not struck and it's those livestock that are still around to be hit in the seventh place. Don't know, but it could be either way. It's not a big problem. Well, we come to the plague of boil, verses 8 to 12. And here we have no warning. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, verse 8, Exodus 9, Take for yourselves handfuls of soot from a kiln, and let Moses throw it toward the sky in the sight of Pharaoh, and it will become fine dust over all the land of Egypt, and it will become boils breaking out with sores on man and beast through all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from a kiln and stood before Pharaoh, someplace where he could see him. Moses threw it toward the sky, and it became boils breaking out with sores on man and beast. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as on all the Egyptians. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not listen to them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. 
This reminds us of the third plague. Remember the third plague? What turned into a plague that time? The dust of the ground. Aaron took his rod and struck the dust of the ground and it gave forth gnats that bit people for a few days. Uncomfortable plague. Well, now we have something worse. We have a very similar thing. Soot goes out over the land like dust and forms boils all over people. So if it's bad enough to be nibbled by gnats, now we've got much more serious plague on the skin of human beings. And again, it's an atmospheric plague. It's a plague that comes primarily against human beings and their animals. So that's parallel to the third plague. Interesting, it says, take soot from a kiln. What would the kilns be? What's made of kilns? Bricks. You can make other things, too. But in this context, we're talking about the bricks. Kilns were the places where the Israelites' servitude was most concentrated. Make bricks without straw. That's been the big context here. Build another tower of Babel out of bricks. Assist the Egyptians in building another tower of Babel. Become absorbed back into the Babelic world. That's what God doesn't want them to do. And so he's breaking that off, breaking them off from this reabsorption into the Babelic world. And so they're not going to become involved in building pyramids out of bricks. And they're not going to be involved in building another tower of Babel. But it's at these kilns where these bricks were fired. So it's precisely from there that the plague comes. The sorrows of the Hebrews are turned against the Egyptians. It's an eye for eye, tooth for tooth type of thing. Brick for brick. You enslave the people, force them to make bricks at these kilns, burn their skin, go through all the uncomfortable things that are involved with that. So now that's turned against the Egyptians. Now their skin is burned by the soot that comes from these kilns. We notice that Moses is the actor here. Moses throws it up in the sky in the sight of Pharaoh. Again, Moses is the actor in the second cycle of plagues. What gods are struck at this time? I didn't mention this before. We've been talking about the fact that these judgments are against all the gods of the Egyptians. The Egyptians had gods of all the livestock in their land, all the different animals. You know what the Egyptian pictures look like, men with heads of animals. And so the plague on livestock clearly strikes against their gods. What gods would be struck against by this plague of boils? The answer is not easy. The answer is the gods of healing. The Egyptians were very, very concerned about personal cleanliness and healing. Remember, we talked about this in connection with the plague of gnats. If you've got bites all over you, you really can't go and serve the gods. The Egyptians were fanatical about that. They shaved themselves. Joseph had to be shaved before he was brought into Pharaoh's presence. And they were so concerned about preserving the external physical body that they built these tombs and they developed these elaborate systems of embalming people to preserve them. And so that's the mentality that you have in Egypt. And now you have people that are covered over with sores and blemishes. And their gods, their healing gods, their medical gods, aren't able to do anything about it. The Egyptians were the doctors of the ancient world. If you were sick, you wanted an Egyptian doctor. They knew a whole lot about that type of stuff. And they had gods who were physician gods. But now those physician gods are impotent. They can't do anything to prevent these plague of boils and sores from being on the people. We notice in verse 11, the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. They affected them so severely that they had to flee the presence of the court. Remember at the end of the third plague, the magicians were defeated in the sense that they were not able to duplicate the plague. Now here at the end of the sixth plague, the magicians are driven out. So each cycle has its closure. We come to the closure here. The magicians are driven out. God is shown to be stronger. And we move into the last three plagues. And let's look at the note that I have here at the bottom of page 22. Because this is important. The soot in the atmosphere corresponds to the palpable darkness of the ninth plague. In both cases, the next plague comes with a warning that enables the believers to escape. Thus, plagues 6 and 7 are a prophetic warning of plagues 9 and 10. Those who experience 6 and 7 should profit from them and heed the warnings concerning plague number 10. Now, what I mean by that is we will notice that the sky is becoming somewhat dark with this dust in the air, this black soot that's thrown up from the kilns and becomes a plague on people. 
The next play, God says a very important thing to the people. And we're moving into the last cycle now, starting in verse 13. Notice the warning that's given. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. So now we're early in the morning again, and we're beginning the last and most intense cycle. Say to him, Thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may be my slaves. And from this time, I will send all my plagues on you. Now this is really the first time this word plague has been used. We call all the rest of the plagues, but these are the real plagues. The rest of them were just little foretastes of plague. This time, these last three plagues will wipe out the land of Egypt. The last four, actually, will just wipe out everything in this country. There'll be nothing left. They'll be laid prostrate. From this time, verse 14, I will send all my plagues to your heart. Literally is what it says. We read over and over again that Pharaoh hardens his heart. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. The hearts of the Egyptians were hardened, and now these plagues go to your heart. They go to the center of your culture. They go to the seat of your being. I will send all my plagues to your heart and your servants and your people so that you may know that there was no one like me in all the earth. None of this, let's include Yahweh and the Pantheon stuff like we saw last week. Oh, yes, go pray to Yahweh for me. Now, I'll include him along with all the other gods, Imhotep and Aten and all the rest. But no, none of this. There's no one like me in all the earth. For if, verse 15, by now I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would then have been cut off from the earth. See, up to now it hasn't been God's hand. It's been Aaron's hand and Aaron's rod. Then it's been Moses' hand. But now it will be God's hand represented by Moses' rod, which is the rod of God or the staff of God. But up till now, God hasn't put forth his hand. He's put forth his representative's hands. Now, the last three, last four are going to be the actual hand of God. Remember that the magicians back in... Chapter 8, verse 19 said, This is the finger of God when they saw the plagues. Now it's the hand of God. Notice the intensification of language. God will put forth his hand in a definitive way. Unlike the other times, it says his hand was put forth, but it was going through the mediators, Aaron and Moses. Now it will be much more direct. If by now I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would then have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this cause, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. God's name gets proclaimed through these events. His name is proclaimed when he's merciful. Notice that implication there. Plagues show forth his strength, but allowing them to remain afterwards, giving them another chance. You see, as long as you're not dead yet, you have another chance. When you're dead, you don't have any more chances. But judgments are always merciful if you survive. Because you always have another chance. And he says, my name is the name of mercy and graciousness because I have given you another chance. And this is important. It's going to be important when we look at it in just a few minutes in a wider theme. Verse 17 says, but still you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow, so they're given time to act. I will send a very heavy hail such as has not been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore send. Bring your livestock and whatever you have in the field to safety. Every man and beast that's found in the field and is not brought home when the hail comes down on them will die. Now does that remind you of something? We have this plague in the atmosphere where the sky is dark by the soot. In the next plague, God says, Everything that's not inside of a house is going to be killed. When does that happen again? That's right. The ninth plague is the plague of darkness you can feel, just like soot in the air, only worse. And the tenth plague, God says, everybody that's not inside a house that has blood on it, your firstborn will die. And you see, this is the warning. And some of the Egyptians listened and some didn't. Verse 20 says, The one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. But he who paid no regard to the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. Now after this plague, they're going to know. Next time, they'll take it even more seriously. Do you see how gracious this is? 
See, this is a prophetic warning. It's grace. Some of these livestock and servants are going to die from hail. I mean, you get hail the size of eggs, ostrich eggs, and other things coming down. You know, hail the size of baseballs coming down. It kills people. And it kills everything that's out there, and it flattens the vegetation. It's devastating, and that's what's going to happen. But next time there's darkness in the sky, and God says, get into a house to be safe, maybe they'll listen better. So this is grace, this graciousness. Maybe you wonder why we've taken this structure so seriously. It's not just because God reveals it that way, but because when we look at the structure, we begin to see the grace involved here. These repetitions of the pattern enabled the people who were sensitive to the word of the Lord to see how God was dealing with them. So there's graciousness here. Get into a house. Get to a place of shelter. And the next time it's going to be get under the blood. Get into a city of refuge to hide from the avenger of blood who comes across the land. Verse 22. Now Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky that hail may fall on all the land of Egypt, on man and on beast and on every plant of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky. Now this is that rod the staff of God, chapter 4, verse 20. And so, in these plagues, God's hand is stretched out. And that's represented by God's staff. Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky. It's not Aaron's staff, it's Moses' staff, the staff of God. And the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran down to the earth, and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Now, where does hail come from? Does it come from the waters below? Or does it come from the waters above? From the waters above. Just like baptism. That's why we prefer to baptize with sprinkling. It doesn't make much difference to get water from below. We want that water from heaven. We want the rain that falls from the glory cloud. We want the waters above the firmament to unite us to the heavenly kingdom. And that's why we baptize with water coming from above just as the Holy Spirit came down upon the people at Pentecost and united them to Christ. And so here, it's water from above. It's rain from God's glory cloud. When the glory cloud descends on Sinai, what does it come as? Fire and thunder and the mountain shakes. Now we have the same thing, only it's not a gentle rain. It's hail. It's a very dramatic picture. And it would have been more to them than to us. We don't think in terms of glory clouds. In the ancient world, they were more familiar with this type of thing. And when you get this phenomena... It's God in his chariot. He's hurling down these stones upon the people. Very powerful and dramatic imagery. And death. Verse 24. So there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. Very severe, such as had not been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. See, God has come now. Aaron came first. Then Moses came. Now God has come. Remember when Elijah stood on the mountain and said that one thing came by, but God was not in that. And that's the first judgment that would come upon Israel. And another thing comes by, and God is not in that. And finally, your English Bible says a still small voice, but actually in Hebrew it says a tremendous crashing sound. Then God comes. It's like a train goes by and the last train is God himself. He comes last. No more time. And if you study out what God says to Elijah there and then you look at the history of northern Israel, you see it. The judgments come and then the kingdom is wiped out. And here it is here too. God has come. He's come with Aaron. He's come with Moses. And now he's come. The glory cloud has come, the fire and the hail. Not since Egypt was a nation. Judgment day. Verse 25. And the hail struck all that was in the field through all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. The hail also struck every plant of the field and shattered every tree of the field. This is language that calls back to mind the early chapters of Genesis where God plants these things and now they're shattered. The land itself is just devastated. Only in the land of Goshen where the sons of Israel were was there no hail. So this impresses Pharaoh. And verse 27, Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I've sinned this time. You wonder what he thought he'd done the other times. But Pharaoh's heart gets soft, you see, when the scourges come. Then it hardens right back up again. That's the sad thing. I have sinned this time. Yahweh is the righteous one. In this contest between me and Yahweh, I admit I was wrong. Yahweh is righteous. I and my people are the wicked ones. Make supplication to Yahweh, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. 
Now, notice what he's doing here. This is important. Make supplication to Yahweh. Who is Yahweh? Who is this Yahweh that I should fear him? First of all, he says, well, all right, you can go out and worship and pray to Yahweh for me. Let's add him to the pantheon. Now he says, make supplication to Yahweh for there's been enough of Elohim's thunder and hail. See, in other words, he's identifying Yahweh with the God, the God who's behind all the gods, the creator God, the one they don't talk about very much, the unknown God, the God who the Gentiles called God most high possessor of heaven and earth, that God. Now Pharaoh's beginning to see. This is what makes it so bad when Pharaoh keeps hiding his heart because it's more and more clear who this is. It's just like in the Gospels, when you get down to the end of Jesus' ministry, they all know full well who he is, and they crucify him anyway. They know who he is. There's no excuse, and they put him to death anyway, and yet God forgives them and gives them one more chance in the book of Acts. It says, I'll forgive you for striking against the Son, but not for blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's amazing. Well, here it is again. It's becoming more and more clear to Pharaoh, not just that Yahweh is a God, and one of the important ones, and he has some special connection with these Hebrews, so I need to respect him. Now it's become impressed on Pharaoh here that this is the God. This is the only God, the one, the God who's behind all the rest. Whatever he might have thought, he's beginning to make that identification. Look at verse 28 again. Make supplication to Yahweh, for there has been enough of Elohim, God's thunder and hail. And I will let you go, and you will stay no longer. He doesn't really send them out. The language isn't as strong as it's going to get. But he says he'll let them go. And Moses said to him, As soon as I go out of the city, I will spread out my hands, my palms, to the Lord, and the thunder will cease, and there will be hail no longer, so that you may know that the earth is Yahweh's. The land is Yahweh's. Go either way. The land of Egypt belongs to Yahweh, not to any of these other gods. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear Yahweh, God. Now verse 31 and 32 are stuck in here to remind us of the fact that it's still possible for more plagues to come. Even though the hail has devastated the vegetation that was growing, there was still some that hadn't grown up yet. So verse 31 says, Now the flax and the barley were ruined, smitten. For the barley was in the ear and the flax was in the bud. How's that written now? Somebody take notice. Flax and the barley were ruined, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was in the bud. What do we call that? We call it a chiasm. All over the place in the Old Testament and in the New. But here's just a little miniature example that shows you the style of uh, biblical writing. The flax and the barley were ruined, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was in the bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not ruined, for they ripen late. They're going to come up and the locusts are going to get them. So, verse 33. Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his palms to the Lord, and the thunder and hail ceased, and rain no longer poured on the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not let the sons of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. In this paragraph, verses 13 to 35, the word field occurs seven times, the word hail occurs 14 times. That's chapter 9. Now, in the time remaining, I'd like for us to think for just a couple of minutes about this business of Pharaoh's heart being hardened. And if you look at your notes, verse 24, we'll go over that. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart, let's just look at this. It's so interesting to notice in Exodus, is so carefully structured numerically. I mean, by now, I hope that you've seen paragraph after paragraph. The key word is there seven times, or it's there ten times. This is just no accident. Not all the books of the Bible are like this. Genesis is. There are all kinds of numerical structures in Genesis that indicate where the divisions in the book are found. Casuto's commentary is, is the best for that. That's where I've gotten most of this. Commentary by a Jewish scholar named Casuto. C-A-S-S-U-T-O. He's very good at pointing things like this out. It shows us again how God writes, at least in this part of the Bible. Actually, 20 times the word heart is used in connection with this hardening. God hardens Pharaoh's heart nine times, we're told. And the verb strengthen, there's actually three different verbs used for this hardening of the heart. In, in our English Bible, it just says, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Your margins might tell you something, but the text is usually translates all three verbs the same way. But they're different verbs. Many times it says God strengthened Pharaoh's heart. And that actually occurs seven times. 
that phrase, God strengthened Pharaoh's heart. One time it says God made Pharaoh's heart hard. That occurs one time in chapter 7, verse 3. And then one time it says God made Pharaoh's heart heavy. He made it heavy. Actually, it's that word kavod. Anybody know what kavod usually translates as? Glorious. The word glorious means heavy. Even in our language, heavy means glorious. Say somebody's heavy. He's got weight. He's got presence. He's glorious. God is heavy. God is glorious. That's the word kavod means to make heavy. So here we don't say God made Pharaoh's heart glorious. We say he made it heavy, hardened it up. Caused him to think that he was important, and so he didn't need to listen. That's the emphasis in that particular verb, is that God made Pharaoh feel like he was so important and glorious and heavy that he didn't have to listen to the plagues. Then we find that Pharaoh hardens his own heart three times, and each time there it's make heavy or make glorious. Pharaoh puffed himself up and thought he didn't need to listen. That's the implication of those verbs. Then we have a passive construction. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. That occurs six times. Four times it says Pharaoh's heart was strengthened. Pharaoh made himself strong. I'm not going to do this. Two times it says Pharaoh's heart was made glorious. He felt too important to listen to this. And then twice we're told that God hardens the Pharaoh's officials' hearts. He strengthens them one time in 14:17. He makes them heavy one time in chapter 10, verse 1. So the numerics that we see here in Exodus are that the, in these verses that talk about the hardening of the heart, the word heart occurs 20 times. Strengthening the heart is used 12 times. Making the heart heavy or glorious is used 7 times. God's strength in the Pharaoh's heart is used 7 times. So emphases there, the reiteration and precise numerical forms serve to emphasize it to us. Now, what should the Hebrews have learned from this? Because they should have learned from it. And what do we need to learn from it? Well, first of all, we learn that God punishes sin by giving people over to it. We don't try to penetrate the mystery of predestination here. It's a mystery, and that's why it's called a mystery, is that we're not supposed to try to understand it. It's something only God can understand. And so our confession tells us that the doctrine of predestination is to be handled with a special care because it's easy for us to try to make ourselves gods and try to figure it out. And it's something we're supposed to leave alone. It's revealed to us, but you would have to be God to understand it. And we're never going to be God, so we're never really going to understand it. We can only talk around it. We know that God, for his own good pleasure, has looked at the sinful mass of humanity and chosen to save some and to bypass others. We also have to say God never, from all eternity, intended to force people to sin. And you say, well, you've kind of said one thing, you've said another, and in between them is a mystery. God never causes people to sin, but he leaves them in it, and God chooses some and bypasses others. Our confession is very particular about that, it says, God, according to his good pleasure, has ordained to bypass some, and then there's a semicolon, and it says, and to cast them into hell for their sins. He didn't bypass them because they were sinners. He bypassed them out of his own decision, and we can't understand that. And there's no point kicking against it, as Paul says in Romans. You just have to leave it be. If God didn't ordain everything that came to pass, he wouldn't be God. There's just no other way you can have a God who creates a world without creating everything in time. See, if God creates time, he creates everything in time. And every event in time is created by him. It all is part of his plan. We just kind of have to leave it at that and yet say that history is also real to God and God cares about the things that people do. Romans 1 says that when people sin, God punishes them by giving them up to their sin so that they sin more. And in this interesting here, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. Pharaoh hardens his own heart. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. These are all parallel ideas. Pharaoh doesn't want to repent, and God has chosen not to grant him grace. And so Pharaoh hardens his heart, and yet it's God's judgment on him to harden his heart for his sins. Pharaoh's not some innocent that God chooses to harden. Pharaoh is a sinner, and God punishes him by allowing him to become more and more of a sinner. That's a frightening idea, but it's what we see here. 
This phrase is used in connection with ten plagues. Each time God plagued Pharaoh, Pharaoh softened up a bit. But it was when God relented that Pharaoh hardened his heart. You have to notice that now. It's when God relents that he hardens his heart. And this is what Israel has to learn and never does. Look at Numbers 14.22, and we'll see a parallel here. Numbers 14.22. Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times, and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land that I swore to their father. Now that pattern is the same. Ten times God brought judgments on the Israelites, and ten times he relented, and every time they hardened their hearts worse. But now he says, they will not enter my rest. They will not go into the promised land. They will not get to enter into the promised land. And see, these people should have learned from Pharaoh how God acts. That's why history repeats itself in the Bible. History is a spiral. It never repeats itself absolutely, but it spirals around the same thing so that we learn, so we can watch the same events happen over and over again. That's what typology is. God causes the same things to happen again and again so that we can learn from them. And they were supposed to learn from Pharaoh that if they kept hardening their hearts every time God relented, he cut them off. And so that's what happens here. He cuts them off. Now the book of Romans points to this and says that the Jews of Paul's day were doing the same thing. The book of Acts shows them repeatedly resisting until finally they're going to be cut off. And one of the major themes in Romans is the Jew-Gentile question and what's going on in this point in history. Paul raises this up as an example. He's talking about the hardening of Israel's heart. And he says in Romans 9:17, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. He says God is hardening those in Israel who are not part of the remnant. And how is he doing it? He's doing it the way he did it with Pharaoh. And he did it throughout all of Old Testament history. And the author of the book of Hebrews makes the same point, speaking about the Jews of his day who were in rebellion. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7. God again fixes a certain day, saying, Today, through David, after so long a time, just as he had said before, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they harden them in the wilderness. And then he says, They will not get to enter into the rest, the rest of the new covenant the rest or Sabbath of the New Covenant. Just as in the wilderness, those who hardened their hearts didn't get to enter into the Promised Land. Now, if we look at Israel in history, we see this over and over again. God brings the people sin. God brings judgment on them. And he relents. And what do they do? They harden their hearts and sin again. And he brings another judgment on them. And then they cry out to him and he relents. What do they do? They harden their hearts. And he brings another judgment on them. And... How many times? It's interesting that it happens about ten times until the end of the Mosaic Covenant. At least the first form of the Mosaic Covenant. Just think about it here. I've got them listed. After the death of Aaron, and remember the death of the high priest cleanses the whole situation. In Numbers chapter 21, there's the plague of serpents, fiery serpents, because of their sin. They repent, but then they get involved with the Midianite women. And remember Phineas kills people who are committing fornication. And that's the second plague. A whole bunch of them died in. And then in Joshua 7, they lose the battle of Ai, but they repent. Then in Judges 3, in the days of Othniel, they're brought into captivity under Cushan Rishathayim, but they repent, and God delivers them. And then they fall again, and they're brought into captivity, and Ehud delivers them. And they sin again, and Deborah delivers them. And they sin again, and Gideon delivers them. And they come into captivity again, and Jephthah delivers them. And they come into captivity again, and Samson delivers them. And then we come to Eli, and Eli won't correct his sons. And what happens? This time, when God brings a judgment in, the tabernacle is torn apart. And the ark is taken captive. And the tabernacle is never put back together again. For a hundred years, they don't have a tabernacle. For a hundred years, the ark is in a little shelter in the house of Abinadab on the hill, and the tabernacle is at Shiloh. And they're separated. And they're not brought back together again until we have the Davidic covenant. If we were to look at the history of the Davidic covenant, we'd find the same kind of thing. Sin and judgment, repentance. Sin and judgment, repentance. Sin and judgment, repentance. I don't know if it happens ten times. It's easy to see kind of a tenfold thing here. 
I didn't bother to read through Kings to see if I could come up with an easy approximately ten times. But you know where it ends? The captivity. They're torn up again. That's the warnings. And it starts here with Plato, this tenfold judgment. The hardening of the heart every time God relents. That's a dangerous thing for us to hear. Because God takes us through rough times and when he does we get real soft toward God and we pray and we cry out and we ask for help and then he relents and we tend to get hard. That's true of everybody. What we don't want is for it to be true with us in the way it was true of Pharaoh or of ancient Israel because eventually they lost it all. They're persuaded of better things because the covenant that God has made with us is everlasting and even though we have these ups and downs in our spiritual life, we hope that we stay soft before God and don't harden our hearts in the ultimate way that Pharaoh did. So that's the application of that, what they should have learned from it and what we can. Now let's close. Father in heaven, we thank you for your warnings. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you give the people ten times to repent and even more. We ask that you would not leave us in a hardened heart condition, but that you would keep us soft before you. And even today, as you renew covenant with us, make us more open to you, if we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.